Did you know you can buy silver at spot price? Get your 10-ounce bar of silver at spot price today. Go to sdbullion.com slash rp. Not only will you be buying silver without any premium, you'll also be supporting the independent media. Reluctant Preppers gets a small commission when you take advantage of this special offer. Going to sdbullion.com slash rp. That's sdbullion.com slash rp. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're pleased to have a returning guest today with a lot of experience coming from a family of multiple generations providing over 60 years of being a premier provider to people wanting to live off-grid, electric-free, and self-reliant living. Galen Lehman, the CEO of Lehman's Incorporated, the uh, ha- renowned hardware store in Kidron, Ohio, that provides not only to and from the Amish community, but to all people interested in living off-grid and in reclaiming some of the knowledge and wisdom of uh, independent and self-reliant living, is here with us again on Reluctant Preppers to talk to us about how where will you get water when you can't trust the tap Galen, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me back. We had you in a couple of sessions already over the over the past uh, fall, talking with us about heat when the furnace is out and light when you when the uh, power is out. And today, if you could talk to us about where will you get water when you can't trust the tap, we have people that some of people live um, a lot. Most most of our viewing audience uh, in North America, and most of them are going to be on municipal water supplies, and uh, some will have well water supplies or others. But in all cases, there's potential for disruption in this most vital source of life that we all depend on. Can you talk to us first about you know? Why should people worry about this? Why should people be concerned? Isn't that something that you can always just count on? You just flip on the the uh, faucet and out will come drinkable, fresh water for your family. Uh, why should people worry about that? Yeah, so you're talking about two different situations there. One is where we are right now, which is where we all, in theory, have access to clean water. The problem is that things can go wrong in that situation, which I'll talk about in a second. And the other situation is if if the, the uh, grid breaks down, if the infrastructure breaks down and we have to uh, end up just drinking whatever water we can find, that means surface water and that means it's going to be contaminated. Uh, so let's go back a second to where we are today. Where we are today, we have safe water. Even if we get it from a well, uh, we assume it's a deep well and the water is clean. The problem is that there is a lot of variables that can that can change that. Even with a municipal water system in a respected city, other than Flint, Michigan, for example, yeah. uh, even in a water system with, with, uh, where everything is done right, all it takes is one mistake or one piece of equipment to fail. Our own municipality here is a small uh, village of a couple thousand people or so, but they have their own municipal uh, water supply, and they've got good people running it, people I know. And those people have made mistakes resulting in bulletins and notifications going out that say don't drink the water. The problem is those don't drink the water bulletins come out after the equipment failure. And by that time, contaminated water is already in the system. So the bottom line is you cannot 100 percent rely on your municipal water system, even if you've never had reason to fear a problem in the past. The other thing is. In many cases, you know, especially in rural communities, people are getting their water from wells. And a, a, a good well is very deep, uh, often in, here in Ohio, often 100 feet or more. Uh, in other places, maybe a little bit less. But a good well is usually deep enough that the ground between the surface and the, where you get your water filters out all the junk. The problem is that junk, like manufacturing chemicals from nearby factories or lawns that were over fertilized or even illegal dumping of um, farm waste or uh, over manuring in, in the in the fields when they fertilize the fields all of those things can get to your groundwater even with a good deep well so the thing you have to be aware of is that no matter where you get your water no matter how safe you think it is there's always a possibility of some failure causing a problem 
And uh, what are some of the contaminants that people really need to be aware of that are most likely to be a day of a day, real hand danger and real uh, present and uh, significant to their family's water supply? So that's really the key question. There's no point in going out and buying, you know, a huge filter system at very high cost if you don't need it and have no expectation to need it. A good way to find out where you're at is to is to do a water test. Um, we have water tests uh, that we sell at uh, layman's.com. In fact, we've set up a special link uh, for your listeners, layman's.com slash reluctant preppers. And if they go to that link, they'll see a supporting article from me as long as well as links to all of the things I'm going to recommend here today. So this water test that we're offering is fairly expensive and it tests for everything. But in addition to that, they can go to their local health department and, and usually not always, but usually you can get a free or almost free water test for some of the basic contaminants uh, from them. And, and that may be a good option. If you, if you can't afford a, a good water test, a, a really good one may cost, almost $200. So if you want to test for everything. So you asked what some of the contaminants are. I've kind of divided them in my head into four different categories. Uh, the one that I think is a major concern for most people, especially after Flint, Michigan was in the news, is lead. Very small amounts of lead uh, can leach out of water pipes, especially in older homes. And even those very small amounts of lead can be enough to damage the brain development in a, in a child. And <clears throat> larger amounts will also affect brain development in adults. A second category that we need to be concerned about is chemicals. Uh, some of those chemicals may have been added by your municipal water supply. Uh, chlorine, chloramine, and fluoride are all uh, chemicals that are added to your water in the name of making the water safer. However, not everybody appreciates having those chemicals in the water. And in some cases, especially with fluoride, the scientific evidence of whether it's good or bad for you is mixed. Uh, there's also chemicals that can leach in, like mercury, PCBs, arsenic, perchlorate, and dioxins. And those typically come from nearby manufacturing plants. Um, here in, in Kidron, we live in a rural area, but there's a truck body plant uh, down the road. And as far as I know, the water's safe. As far as I know, there's no danger to it. But I have noticed that in a downstream direction from that plant, there is a lot, a number of cases where people have gotten cancer and died from it. And it almost makes me wonder, well, what are they dumping on the ground? What's leaching into the water system? Uh, so that's the um, third uh, category, uh, which is chemicals. The fourth one is, um, I guess you'd say bugs. We've got all kinds of bacteria, uh, most commonly E. coli, coliform, uh, and less, it's less common, but you also have Giardia and Cryptosporidium. Those, all, all four of those typically are not deadly, but they can make you pretty sick. And if you have elderly or children in the home, uh, in theory, they could be deadly as well. And, you know, you just don't want to put your, that stuff in your body. Coliform, for example, typically, if you have coliform in your water, it typically means that you have um, um, waste, human waste. Well, let's say waste from warm-blooded animals could be human or livestock leaching into your water. Nobody wants to drink that. Uh, so that's where the filtration comes in. And... Uh... Of all of these uh, various threats that can impact our drinkable water supply, how can people impact that? How can people protect themselves? How can they control their uh, water supply despite these threats? Well, the good news is that a lot of times it doesn't take much. It just You have to do something. You can't do nothing. But in many cases, it's not that expensive and not that hard. The key is to know what type of contaminations you can expect. If you live in a rural area, away from factories, then your expectations would be limited to the bacteria or field fertilizer. Uh, if you live in an urban area, then you're more worried maybe about fluoride or lead. Uh, so that's one thing is to be aware of what's around you and what type of contaminants there could be as a result. The other thing is to get a water test. So looking at those contaminants I named, uh, I can just give you some examples. If you, if you have lead, Lead can be removed uh, by running the water through carbon or distilling the water or uh, running it through reverse osmosis. And that's 
The same thing is true of most other chemicals, including fluoride and, uh, and chlorine. Uh, they can be removed by reverse osmosis, uh, carbon, uh, and in many cases, distillation, although there's some limits on that. And then the other one uh, is bacteria, and bacteria can be removed uh, by as little as putting it under a UV light, and UV light filters are available. Uh, the interesting thing is, when I, I grew up in Africa, and when I was in Africa, we would kill bacteria by putting clear water, you can't do it with muddy water, clear water in a saucer in the sun, and lots of UV light coming down from the sun. By the end of the day, the water was considered safe to drink. So UV light is one thing that will kill bacteria. Uh, you can run it through a ceramic filter, you can boil it, or you can uh, distill it. So you've got a number of options for each of these contaminants. In order to apply those technologies or those techniques that you described, what kind of tools uh, should people be aware of are available, and how do these? Uh, to what kind of cost ranges and effectiveness of applying these of these different techniques do these different tools offer? So there's a number as, of uh, options available, as I said earlier, and many of them are not that expensive. Uh, the thing that I always counsel when people are thinking about buying supplies for a disaster uh, is, or to be prepared for whatever may come your way is to think carefully about your situation and about what you're preparing for. Uh, a big factor there is how many people will be, uh, will you want to help protect with this water filter system uh, or how many people do you want to have to, uh, how many people do you want to supply safe water to? So if you have a family of two or three, or if you're even on your own, that's a completely different situation when you have a, uh, a small community of maybe 30 people or 50 people, those are two completely different situations. And, and you need to think about how many people are going to be looking for a water supply uh, from the tools that you buy. Uh, the second thing is, what do you expect to do? If you're going to stay in one place, that might have, uh, that might mean one type of solution. If you expect to need to travel quickly, for example, uh, you, want, you want to design a bug out bag, uh, that's a whole other situation. You need something very small and very portable. And I have options for all of those situations, for traveling, for staying in one place, for doing many, helping many people or helping a few people. Uh, the key is to know what, what, ex what your expectations are. The other two factors are, are you expecting to have access to utilities? Uh, for somebody who's prepping for simple things like power failures. Municipal water keeps running through a power failure for a period of time, uh, depending on how well prepped your municipal water supply utility is. That might be a few days or might even be weeks. So if you expect to have access to utilities, you're prepping for a short-term disruption, uh, that opens up a whole new series of options for you. And the last thing that I keep going back to is what kind of contaminants are you prepping for? Uh, do you want me just to run down through each of the contaminants and filter systems? Yeah, why don't you just take us through a, a journey through what you consider to be you know, reasonable uh, threats to consider, uh, reasonable techniques to deal with those, and what kind of range of options and costs are, are available in each of those categories. And we'll provide, we'll take notes along the way so people can refer to those, and, and your uh, link that we're going to provide will give people the ability to refer back for more information so people can just kind of listen in and get it, get it first exposure to this information, and they can follow up with more detail later, sure. Okay. So the, the link, again, is layman's.com slash reluctant preppers. And I'll start with, like, the absolute disaster, worst-case scenario. Everything fails, and it's going to be failed for a long time. So now you're basically living off of surface water. In that situation, uh, you want to travel light, and you don't want to have uh, – uh, you want to have – the simplest possible options and the simplest possible options. If you're drinking surface water, the biggest contaminant you're going to be dealing with is bacteria. Mm -hmm. And the simplest option is to boil it or put it in a saucer in the sun. Just make sure if you use the saucer in the sun idea that it's the water is uh, settled, you know, like river water is muddy and the sunlight won't get down to the bottom of the saucer. Uh, you know, you can't produce a lot of water that way. And, it's difficult to produce, but at least you can get some water in a in a dire emergency. 
if you have sunlight. Also I mean, if you have if if you got a lot of cloudiness, cloudiness, uh, raininess, yeah. or different, or or if it's winter, that, that can be difficult. So go ahead. That's a good. I'm glad you brought that up because it depends on your client. You know, when climate. You know, when we were in Africa, we had sunny days during the dry season. We had sunny days for months, and uh, that's a whole different situation. We were tropical sun every day, no problems using the sunlight. But if you don't have access to sunlight, like Ohio winters are a good example. We have cloud cover 80% of the time. Uh, that limits you some more. So one of the options that we offer if you want to just upgrade a step is distillation. Uh, we have a non-electric distiller. You need a heat source. And the drawback is it takes a lot of energy. Uh, it's portable, but, uh, you know, not super portable. It's not like you, if you have a bunch of stuff to carry on your back, uh, it's going to feel pretty bulky. Uh, but it's all stainless steel. It's extremely durable, uh, under $500. I think the, uh, I think you can rely on distillation to probably get rid of every chemical or bacteria contaminant you'd have to work with, with two kind of cautions. One is you want to keep the distiller clean. Otherwise the water will be recontaminated with bacteria after the water condenses. And the other thing is that some uh, chemicals, if you're in an area with a lot of industrial development, some chemicals have a lower uh, boiling point than water. So you're, you're, you're boiling your water, the chemicals evaporate, then they recondense and they go right back into your water. Uh, or there may be clouds of steam that are laced with a chemical that you don't want to breathe. And uh, you can also have chemical contaminants left over in the boiling pan after you're done. Now, those are extreme cases, you know, like you're you're right in the middle of a area with a lot of factories uh i think your biggest uh your biggest drawback with distillation is that is the heat source that's required and the amount of time that it takes uh so those are like your two kind of worst case scenarios i mentioned before that if you're in a area with uh, a good municipal water supply a power failure may only cause uh, or may not cause any disruption in water supply. And in that case, you've got running tap water and you've got water pressure. Uh, that's, that's really your best situation. The other thing is if you're, if you're just worried about your water and you, you want to treat it as a matter of course, which I do and which I think everybody should do, uh, you, you know, you drink, you drink half a gallon a day if you're healthy. And I think uh, you put that much in your body, you want to make sure it's going in clean. The best thing I can offer right there is reverse osmosis. It's widely available. Uh, it's easy to maintain. It's relatively inexpensive, under $300. Uh, typical reverse osmosis system will produce about 50 gallons a day, which is plenty for even for a large family. I mean, most people only drink uh, half a gallon a day or so. And reverse osmosis removes practically everything. I mean, there's just almost nothing that gets by it. Bacteria is possible, but not likely. Everything else is removed. Um, it's uh, A lot of people are confused by the word reverse osmosis. Well, what does it do? And I can boil that down into a real simple description for you. It's not 100% scientifically accurate, but it gets the message across of what it is. If you could imagine a super thin plastic membrane and water is pushed against the membrane, and the membrane has microscopically small holes in it that allow clean water to pass, but everything else has to go by it. And as everything else is going by it, some water is going by it too. Some water never makes it through the membrane. And that water washes away the contaminants, so the filter never plugs. Uh, a good reverse osmosis filter also has charcoal filters before it and charcoal filters after it. The result is water that tastes amazing. The reverse osmosis that I have in my house, people come here from all, you know, friends from across the state, friends from the city. They come here and they're like, wow, your water tastes great. What, what's the secret? And the, the secret is reverse osmosis. You can take chlorinated water and make it chlorine free. You can take um, water that has a salt flavor and remove a lot of the salt flavor. It's just it, it does practically everything for usually for under three hundred dollars, like I said. Yep, we uh, about a year and a half ago added a not only a whole house uh, carbon activated carbon on our entire water supply for our house, but then a RO unit with a with a pressurized storage tank, and that supplies uh, our 
cold water spigot, hot water spigot at the uh, kitchen, uh, as well as the ice maker for the fridge. So we've got uh, access to drinking water uh, any time like that. The one trick about RO that I bet you were about to mention is that it requires, as you mentioned, for it to work, you have to have a pressurized uh, input water support source. Yeah, that's right. And, and, you know, it's, it can't be, it can't be weak pressure either. It has to be normal pressure. So uh, in a situation where the municipal water supply is questionable and the water pressure is possibly dropping, uh, the the reverse osmosis may not work. Uh, You also hit on something there about filtering the water for your ice maker. Uh, It does no good to kill the germs in the water and take the contaminants out of the water. If you put ice in your water, that's contaminated. So yeah, I think it's important if you put a system in like you're describing that you do hook it up to everything, you're cooking with it, uh, you're making ice with it, and you're drinking it, and then you have 100% protection from every, every water input that you have uh, to, your, to your household. You also, you also, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned carbon, and carbon is not a bad system either. Carbon removes a lot of contaminants. Uh, It's it's close to where reverse osmosis is. There's some kinds of chemicals that can get by it. Um, The problem, there's one problem with carbon, and that is that carbon works uh, by bonding to chemical contaminants. The carbon molecule bonds to chemical contaminants. And and the water is flowing through the carbon block, dirt, like big clunks of dirt, if there are any, are filtered out because they can't pass through the carbon. But if the chemical uh, in the water is passing through the carbon and uh, the carbon has already been used up in the sense that all the other carbon molecules have bonded with other chemical molecules, the chemicals can then pass right through. So the important thing with carbon to emphasize is that the carbon block has to be replaced on a, on a schedule and kept on that schedule. Uh, reverse osmosis doesn't have that problem. It, it, it keeps going until possibly a year or two or three in the future the the membrane might tear, which you would be able to tell because the pressure would change uh, on your reverse osmosis system. But with carbon, the water keeps coming as if, I mean, there's no difference except the chemicals are getting through. There's no difference in pressure. There may be no difference in taste. So that's something to be aware of with carbon. Uh, but carbon's a great option if you want something inexpensive. Uh, a whole house system isn't isn't cheap, but a, uh, a, run, a drinking water only carbon system, you could have one of those usually for less than $100. They're not expensive at all. And uh, beyond carbon uh, you, you also mentioned uh, pumping uh, if you're going to I- increase your ability to do filtration for groups uh. yeah so w- now we're moving toward a place where you don't have utilities but you can take equipment with you so in the first case we were looking at a, a big disaster where you can't take equipment with you in the second case we're looking at you still have US municipal uh, utilities available and that's a good Probably, I mean, that's a system everybody should have, in my opinion. Then the other thing is to prep for a disaster where you don't have utilities. And there's a number of ways that you can actively filter water. You don't have to carry a big distiller with you. uh, And you can actively filter water in an extremely effective way. So uh, we we have small portable pumps. There's uh, the most common brand, like the leading brand, is one that's made in Switzerland, and it has an unusual name of Katadyne, sure. uh, K-A-T-A-D-Y-N. And Katadyne is uh, used by Red Cross. It's EPA certified. It gives absolute and, and um, as complete as, as can be done removal of um, all, all the kinds of bacteria you're worried about, E. coli, uh, Giardia, Cryptosporidium. Uh, and, and these pumps, these pump systems that they have are very small and readily portable, like um, they often refer to them as pocket filters. You'd have to, you'd have to have a mighty big pocket, but it's, it's close to fitting in your pocket anyway. Uh, and uh, they, they unfold like the size of a flashlight. They've got a little pump on the side or on the back and you pump the water. Uh, the biggest complaint I've ever heard is that you have to, uh, you have to 
actively pump. It's like uh, an old-fashioned tire pump. It wears you out after a bit. Uh, but they produce water, and they last for a long time. The the limitation on filtration like this is that the outside of the filter can be plugged. And the advantage on this catadine type of filter is that the filter element is made out of a ceramic material. The water passes through the ceramic material and the dirt is removed, the bacteria is removed, and water is safe to drink. They won't remove chemicals. That's the only limitation. And when that uh, filter gets plugged, you can just brush off the outside. You remove a very thin layer of the filtering element and you remove the plugged part and the filter works like new. And that can be brushed repeatedly uh, as it plugs. Eventually you have to replace the element, but it can go a long time. Some of those filters are even available with a carbon core. And with the carbon core, then you've got some chemical removal as well as the bacteria removal. Right. Cata- and, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say no, that no, I'm go familiar, ahead. familiar with uh, the uh, you you've been mentioning the pumping from Katadyne. Uh I understand that there's also uh, highly recommended uh, drip type filters that have the ceramic elements, and you can get the optional uh, carbon on them. Uh, I'm familiar with Berkey. I don't know if what what uh, other ones you're going to be talking about. Yeah, so that's a good example. Berkey's a U.S. made a filter with that uses. Uh, dripping, or let let me uh, explain a little bit more what we mean by that. You've got two tanks, one for the clean water and one for the dirty water, and and you put the dirty water tank on top, and then the water drips through the the ceramic elements and gets into the lower tank, and by the time it's in the lower tank, it's clean. If you get the pure ceramic kind, you remove all the bacteria. If you get the ceramic kind with the carbon core, then you're removing bacteria and many chemicals. Uh, it's the same exact technology that I just described as the cat- on the catadine filter. Instead of pumping it through and getting fairly fast production for a lot of work, you get slower production, but there's no work required. All you got to do is fill the top tank. And these are very popular with people that live in remote areas and have, uh, are fairly, uh, don't have to move a lot. Uh, the, the filter systems like this can be packed into a small box about 12 by 12 by 12, roughly. It's not super portable, but it's extremely light. Uh, it's bulkier than the, than the pocket filter, but there's no work required. And drip filters have been so popular that we've got, at Layman's, we've got three different options. So you can buy the Catadine, which is the original, uh, for a little bit less than $400. You can buy the Berkey which is the USA made uh, filter that copies the technology that Catadyne came up with. And that one's under 300 and the Berkey is much more popular because of the price savings at layman's. We've looked at the technology ourselves and we've designed our own filter using the exact same technology with lower cost components. And that one's under $200. So you have a number of options there and all of them in terms of effectiveness are going to do exactly the same thing. And, those are a great option if you're in a stationary location and you want to remove all of the bacteria and most of the chemicals. Now, the big factor is portability. Portability. Uh, if you're in a, in a bad situation where there's a disaster everywhere, most often you're going to need to move. And if, if you're just trying to protect one person, you want an extremely small, extremely portable uh, bug out bag, uh, the life straw is a great item to carry. Again, it uses the same technology. Uh, it's like a straw on steroids. It's, you know, maybe an inch in diameter and about the same length as a regular straw okay. for $25 for $25. It'll, it's one person, uh, unless, unless you trade it between people. I mean, you can just take turns sucking on it. It sucks the water up through the ceramic filter, takes the bacteria out and you can, cap it up and throw it back in your bag and you're good to go again. In addition to those options, um, you mentioned uh, that in between the pumping option and the, uh, and the drip option, uh, a siphon option. And I'm not familiar with that one. Oh yeah. I'm glad you reminded me of that. So the siphon option takes the catadine ceramic filter. So it's the same ceramic technology and then it has a long hose on it. So you find your water source, you scoop up a bucket of it, you put the bucket on a 
table or something like that, you take this tube and you suck on the tube until the water starts coming out of the tube. And then you put the mouth of the tube below where the bucket is. And now the water will siphon just, just like during the, the uh, oil crisis in the seventies, we used to siphon gas from our gas tanks. Right. You, yep. Once, once you get the water going in a downhill way, it'll flow on its own. So in that case for, uh, very inexpensive, under $100, you can get the same siphoning technology. This would be your your lowest cost way to get high volume uh, ceramic filtering, removing virtually all of the bacteria, getting safe water. This would be your lowest cost way to do it, and it doesn't require any work. There's just one limitation. Remember I said you're going to put this straw in your mouth and suck on it to get the water flow started? Well, is the straw clean? Uh, was the ceramic filter in a clean bag, so when you dropped it in the water, you didn't contaminate everything around it? Uh, <clears throat> I would say the ceramic filter, the siphoning system of the ceramic filter takes a little bit more uh, caution in the way that you use it to avoid contamination. Just for example, you've, you've dropped the ceramic filter in a dirty source, and you've filtered your water, you've got clean water. Now you take the ceramic filter, you coil up the the hose, and you put it in the bag. Well, now the clean hose just touched the dirty filter, and so you've got contamination by transference. Um, it just requires a few, a little bit of common sense care, uh, but that is the one limitation on siphoning. It's a great, it's a great system. It works just as well as the other systems. It just requires a little bit more caution, which is, I guess, you know, it's justified because it's a lot less money. How would you provide clean water for a larger group, whether you have a large family or multiple families that are uh, hiding out together or huddling together in the, in the case of hard times? Yeah, that's a great question. And we've got, there's a brand new filter system that fits in a backpack. Remember I told you that reverse osmosis was the best system, uh, but requires water pressure. So we've got a reverse osmosis system that fits in a backpack. It's got an intake hose and it's got a output hose runs off of solar power. It's got integrated battery. Uh, in case there's no sunlight, you can run it and it's USA made. So you carry it on your backpack, uh, weighs about 25 pounds. It's not, that's not super light, but it's for a backpack, it's light. I mean, if you're a normal backpack, I think weighs 40, 50 pounds. And uh, this is a way for you to carry the water supply for a large group of people. You can make a hundred pounds of water. I mean, a hundred gallons. You can make 100 gallons of water a day uh, with the power that's supplied, no, no utility power, just with a small solar panel attached. And the purity of the water will, will meet uh, or exceed World Health Organization standards. So chemicals are out, bacteria is out, just drop one end in, flip a switch, and the water comes out at pressure. I mean, it's... It's astonishing how much water it produces in a short amount of time. I was so impressed when we tested it. Uh, pumping water right out of a pond, brown water with who knows what in it, pump it into a bucket. We took the water that we pumped and took it to, and water tested it, and it was clean. Sounds like a very important resource to be aware of, but uh, you've mentioned production of clean water. Uh, what about storage of clean water? I know when we put in our our uh, RO unit that I mentioned in our home, we up we kicked in a little extra to get this 14 gallon pressurized tank. It it basically has a, um, a, a elastic membrane and at the midline, kind of like a diaphragm at the midline of the tank inside, and the bottom half of the tank is is pressurized with an inert gas, probably nitrogen or argon or something, and when the uh, RO water is injected into the top half of the tank from the uh, production system, then it it displaces that elastic membrane down, 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 and pushing it down against pressure. So then, when we want to take take uh, fluid, you know, clean water out, we just turn on the spigot, and the pressure that's in the bottom of the tank and the membrane push uh, the water back up. So even if we had a complete power outage. Even if we lost municipal water pressure, we'd still have at least that 14 gallons of RO water that are under pressure in that tank ready for dispensing. Are there other uh, storage options like that that people should be aware of? Yeah, so you've got um, a number of options there, and I think the idea of storage is important. Uh, you can go at it by using a purchased 
uh, system, uh, which we which we sell purchase systems that that hold you know multiple gallons, 10, 20, 30 gallons of water. Um, or you can just use old old milk jugs, you know, rinse them out, make sure they're clean, and uh, you can store your water gallon at a time anywhere you want in the house. The thing that many people don't realize is that any well system, uh, any any house that gets its water from a well has a pressure tank in the system. <clears throat> this is a standard part of any house water system that gets its water from a well. So the pressure tank that you're describing that holds um, probably – it might hold 10, 12 gallons, you think? Mm-hmm. It's called 14 uh, gallon nominee, there's a, but I don't know how much of that is, is useful capacity, right? It, that's right. Yeah, right. Some is water, some is the is the pressurized uh, uh, gas, whatever it is, air or argon or whatever. Um, so the your house, if you have a well, <clears throat> your house has a pressure tank on it, and that pressure tank probably holds 40, 50 gallons. Um, I know... In, in dry states, they often have irrigation systems, and even people with municipal water get their water from a well to irrigate with. And uh, those those have a pressure tank on them that may hold 20 gallons. So there's often places in your house system, especially if you get water from a well, uh, there will be a place in your house system where water is retained. The other thing is when you know a disaster is coming, uh, it's a great idea to fill your bathtubs, fill your sinks and you've got standing water you can use uh, another one that really grosses my wife out but which in my opinion is perfectly safe is to take it from the tank on the back of your toilet you you know many homes have two three bathrooms each of those tanks may hold four, four or five gallons of water if you're not putting those little chemical tablets in the tank that keep your toilet clean the water in your tank is very likely it may have some germs in it from being stored in a dirty tank uh, but it's there's no sewage. There's no. I mean, I personally have drunk water from that tank with no ill effects, and I think you're safe to drink it 99% of the time. So uh, a lot of it is planning ahead, like storing water in a in a, a tank. Uh, a lot of it is just knowing where there's water in your house system if you have an extended power failure. Do you recommend people can, who really are serious about providing a quantity of, of clean water for their family in case of an of extended uh, outage pr- look into the option of some kind of an elevated tank either inside their house or outside their house where they could get gravity storage? I mean, you mentioned that municipal water supplies can still function for a while when the power is completely out. And by most communities, that would be by virtue of those those large water towers you see standing around in communities. That's a time-proven proven method of you've got uh, elevated source of water, you get stored potential energy there, and it can come down through gravity pressure. Um, is there any sense uh, in people considering replicating that on a small scale at the domestic uh, home level? I I think in most cases it's not practical, and here's why: if you look at those municipal systems, those tanks are um, I don't know how high in the air. What do you think? Hundred feet? They're up there, right? They vary, but they're high. Yep. Yep. Uh, what we found is that. Even in a two-story home, if you put the water tank in the attic, the pressure that you get at the tap is extremely low. Uh, It's just not tall enough. There's a formula that gives the pounds of pressure for every foot in the air you go, and I can't remember what it is, but the the buildup is very slow. So the reason that we know that is because here in Amish country, there are a lot of Amish families that do that. They put the storage tank in the attic. They pump the water up there with a windmill, and then they take the water by gravity flow. But I can tell you this, I've been in those homes, and um, I can't imagine that taking a shower under that kind of water pressure would be very satisfying. Okay. It comes, I mean, you can do it, but it comes out slow. So for survival so purposes, the, yes. For cuff, comfort purposes, maybe not. Yeah, and even for survival purposes, you know, I think... I think in, in, in this, when you're in a survival situation, the idea that you're going to have all the comforts that, that we have gotten used to is unlikely. Right. And so my view is keep it simple, keep it inexpensive. Uh, that means to me, that means, hey, uh, let's go down in the basement and get another gallon of water from the, from the one gallon milk cans that we have stored down there. Well, Galen, you have given us quite a tour of what the types of threats are, what the techniques and technologies are, and what the tools are to apply those technologies. Is there any last uh, thought that you can uh, add that would wrap that all up for our for our listeners? 
Sure. I, I just want to remind you again of the uh, website uh, that we've set up, laymans.com slash reluctant preppers. Uh, so we'll we'll be putting information there and add to it as time goes on or as we get uh, feedback from your listeners. Uh, the main thing is that in an emergency, water is what you need. You can go, you can survive tremendous variations in temperature. You can survive uh, blazing sun or very cold weather for surprisingly period for surprising periods of time, but you cannot survive without water. And so setting aside some water now when you have a ready, clean supply is such an easy thing to do. It doesn't even require any money. You just get, get used milk cans, make them clean, and put water in them. Uh, that's the simplest thing you can do right now. And if you want to have a more reliable supply, uh, a pumping water filter or drip water filter is the way to go. When people do that kind of domestic simple storage and just ordinary old clean containers of, of water from whatever their current water supply is, do you recommend adding any chlorine or other chemicals to provide you know, safe storage over a period of time? So I'm, I think there's mixed information out there on that. I have not found a clear answer from anybody whether that's required or not. When I've stored water, I've stored it for months at a time. And when I go down and get it and, and, and pour it out, it's clean and it feels safe to drink and nobody in the house gets sick. So rather than loading it up with chemicals, which I never like using a chemical option when there's other options available, I, I would recommend just rotating it. So instead of putting it down in your basement or uh, in your closet or somewhere and forgetting about it, uh, if, you, if you decide you're going to store 10 gallons every week, Put a fresh gallon in, take an old one out, and then you don't have to you don't have to add chemicals to it. If there's a disaster, uh, you're going to be consuming it pretty quickly, and the question of whether you need chemicals to preserve it won't won't even be an issue. You're just going to be you're going to be sucking it down. You might even have to ration it if you don't have a filter system. Uh, so um, I, I don't think chemical preservation is needed. I know there's people out there that don't agree with that, but I personally I'd rather not. I'd rather not drink the chemicals, so I'm, I just use it untreated. Very good. Galen Lehman, CEO of Lehman's. Thank you so much for joining us on Reluctant Preppers, and uh, you've joined us about heat, about light, about water. We'd sure like to have you back on other topics because you've got a wealth and breadth of information that we could uh, share with our viewing audience, and just thanks again for joining us here. I'm, I'm glad to do it. It's always a pleasure to talk with you.